Like Paul, we also must count all of our achievements as nothing but rubbish in the face of what God is willing to do for us, in the face of what Christ has done for us, in the face of all we can get by faith. You see, that is the great exchange. Welcome tonight, welcome to Church Online tonight, and welcome to Life Shape. God bless you, I'm glad you're here. We are tonight in block number 10. It's hard to imagine, we've already completed nine life block lessons. And um, in lesson number 10, we're, tonight we're going to be taking a look at the subject of righteousness. Righteousness, that's kind of a religious term, but it's a very important term. Uh, there are so many. In fact, uh, many of the promises are tied to the righteous. The Bible says that the Lord will not withhold any good thing from those who walk uprightly before him. Isn't that wonderful? To know that God has no intent, no purpose, no will to withhold any good thing from the righteous, from those who are upright before him, who walk right before him. Well, our Life Shape Prayer and Discipleship Block 10 on Righteousness is going to begin tonight with a commentary, and then we'll get to some scriptures, and ultimately we'll share some important points tonight. And for those of you that are watching uh, here in the United States and around the world, I trust you have also prayed this week. Hopefully, uh, uh, like us, we just took uh, uh, some time before uh, we went live with this teaching to seek God according to 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, will seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, he said, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, I will heal their land. And uh, that's what we've been doing tonight. And uh, isn't it wonderful to see our altars so filled with all these young people and all these uh, youth down here? Each I didn't even ask them to come down tonight. And they just filled up all of our altars all the way across from one side to the other uh, with prayer of, uh, you know, for, for individuals, them individually, for their family, for the church, their community, and their nation. And uh, thank you also, those of you that are joined together with us in Life Shade. We believe that God will hear our sincere and humble prayer as we recognize and admit how dependent we are upon Him. As we take time each week to seek His face and not just His hand, not just His blessings, but seek His face, to seek His pleasure. And then as we commit to turn, each week a little turn will make a difference. Just a little change on the inside of us will make huge rippling changes all around us. So I encourage you to take an opportunity every week to make some little change, some little turn. It may seem small in your moment, but you and I both know that, 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 that you know, day after day after day, when we look in the mirror, we do not see ourselves changing that much. But I just went to my 40 years year class reunion. I have been looking at myself every day in the mirror now for the 40 years since I graduated high school, and I can tell you I have not changed, but every one of those people have, you know, you just, um, uh, and, and they thought the same about me. Why? Because even though I could not see the little change day by day, I didn't notice it as much day by day by day by day, yet in looking back, uh, uh, you know, not having uh, uh, seen yourself as others see you for a period of time, growing little by little, all of a sudden you realize you have gone a long way down the road and you've changed a whole lot. And uh, that's the way life is. So don't despair those little incremental strategic steps you take, commitments you make to change just a little bit. Don't, don't negate the power of a little change, what a little change on the inside of you can do in its rippling effects all around you, especially over time. Well, uh, the subject of righteousness, okay? Adam and Eve were created right with God, okay? They were right with God. Uh, they initially lived in what we uh, understand is right standing with God. They, uh, they had the right, they were granted the right and the privilege to stand in the presence of a holy God. Can you imagine that? A right 
to stand in the presence of Almighty God. That's what righteousness is, right standing, the right to stand. You see, it was nothing that Adam and Eve did to achieve this right standing. They were created righteous. When God created them, he created them righteous. He created them with a right to stand in his presence. He created them right with him. He created them righteous. It's, it's as though they were covered. In fact, they were. With this covering, with this cloak, with this robe of righteousness, like a king would be covered and cloaked in a regal robe so that everyone would be able to identify him, know who he is. Righteousness is that cloak, that robe, that not only identifies us, but also gives us a right to stand in the presence of a holy God. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God, sin separated them. Do you remember we talked about how sin separates? It separated man from one another. It separated man from God. What, what caused that separation? Well, it separated man from the righteous covering that he had, from his regal robe, from his right standing with God. And no longer did man have the right to approach God or to stand in his presence. Sin separated them from that righteous covering. Uncloaked as they were, they stood for the very first time on their own naked and ashamed. Of course, man has been trying to do this same thing ever since. They immediately tried to make their own righteous covering. They immediately tried to make their own covering. But it didn't work. It might fool someone around them, but it could not fool a holy God because they did not have right standing with God. They were naked and ashamed, disrobed, in front of all creation for creation to observe. They felt naked. They felt ashamed. They tried to cover themselves, but it could not restore the righteousness of God to their life. Adam and Eve hid from God in the garden. Why? Because they knew they did not have the right to stand in his presence. They hid from God. God called out to them as he still calls out to unrighteous people today. He called out to them to come to him. They came to God and there they confessed their sin before God. After confessing their sin, God made a sacrifice. He clothed them with the skins and no doubt the blood covered that sin. But in God covering their sin and covering them even from one another. Yet that was only a temporary measure. The skins would not last forever. The blood of the animals would not pay an eternal debt. It was just temporary. You see, only the blood of Messiah, the perfect Lamb of God, could take away the sin of the world forever and restore righteousness. Throughout history, in fact, up until today, mankind has gone about endeavoring, still continually trying to establish their own righteousness. <laughs> He's covered himself with good works. We have covered ourselves with well-meaning uh, attempts to do right things, you know. But in and of ourselves, on our own, we can never measure up to what the grace of God has provided through the blood of Jesus. Many sacrifices have been made, but none can relieve the eternal burden of sin except the blood of Christ. This Messiah gave his life to restore what was lost in the garden. This relationship that allows, that even uh, 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 demands, we stand in the presence of God. Righteousness, both in this life and throughout eternity, comes only by grace. We cannot achieve it. We can't make it. We cannot do enough works for it. Righteousness, 
in this life, right standing with God, righteousness in this life and in eternity only comes by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Romans, the 10th chapter, verse 3 says this, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. The, the, the Apostle Paul was talking about those who are always going about trying to establish their own righteousness. They're always going about trying to do good works. They're always going about trying to, to keep some set of rules that they think will make them closer to God. When in fact, they going about attempting to establish their own righteousness, no matter how good they got, if they did not submit themselves to the righteousness of God, which is provided by grace through faith, then they will never be right. Righteousness is the state of a person's life when God is pleased with them. Let me say that again. Righteousness is the state of a person's life when God is pleased with that person. When God is pleased with someone, what is conferred by God's pleasure is a right to stand in his presence. It's righteousness. We cannot count on our good work, works, of course, to please God because the Bible says there's basically one thing that pleases God. It's our trust in him. It's our faith. Hebrews says that without faith, verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 6, it is impossible to please God. It's not possible to please God unless you're willing to trust him, unless you're willing to believe him. That's what Eve did in this reverse of righteousness. She came to the place where she did not trust, did not believe, and therefore departed from righteousness. And in that departure, sin was born and division and separation was created eternally for everyone who attempts to cover themselves. We can't count on our good works, as I said, to please God, but rather we please Him when we believe Him and when we trust in Him. You can later read, if you would, Romans, the fourth chapter. The whole chapter deals with our righteousness, the righteousness which comes to a person who will trust in the Lord who will believe God. Good works follow our faith. They do not lead our faith. Good works are the results of our relationship with God, born out of righteousness. Righteousness is not born out of good works. Philippians chapter 3, the apostle Paul writing to the church in Philippi said this in verse 8, Yet indeed I also count all things loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord. Basically he's saying everything I have gained, all of my good works, the fact that I am a studied man, the fact that I'm a learned teacher, the fact that I am a devout Jew, the fact that I have kept the law, all of these things I count but loss. He said, for whom, for, for, for Christ, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may win Christ. Compared to what Christ has done and compared to what grace can provide, everything I could do for myself, no matter how good I could be, means nothing. He says in verse 9, you know, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law. Even I were to, if, if, if I were to keep the law, I still can't be found in Christ. But rather that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. <laughs> the righteousness which God gives when we trust him. Rather than me attempting to, uh, to, to accomplish or to achieve by good works or by a, a great life or by a clean a mind, whatever I might be... Uh, prone to do whatever I might be capable or able to do in my attempts to please God, not anything I could do could ever measure up to what I get when I just believe God. When I trust 
him. You see, it is the righteousness, the apostle Paul said, the righteousness of God by faith he had rather have than his own righteousness, even by keeping the law, even by following every tenet of the law that could not produce what God is willing to give if we will just believe him. It comes by faith. Right standing with God comes when we trust him. Like Paul, we also must count all of our achievements as nothing but rubbish in the face of what God is willing to do for us, in the face of what Christ has done for us, in the face of all we can get by faith. You see, that is the great exchange. Jesus took our sin and we became his righteousness. That's the great exchange that happened on the cross of Calvary for all who will now believe. This great exchange comes to pass. It's being born again. It's a conversion by the salvation of our souls when we believe God, trust Him, and come through Christ into the grace of God. We obtain salvation and righteousness is given to us. A right to stand in God's presence. God being pleased with us because we believe him, because we trust him, because we have believed upon his son and entered through his son into the grace of salvation, into the grace of righteousness, which is by faith. In and of our own selves, we can never achieve this righteousness. We can never be deserving of all that God freely gives to those who trust him. Righteousness only comes by faith. It only comes through the mercy of God, through Christ Jesus, because we believe. Titus 3, 5 says this, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. It's the goodness of God, the favor, the grace, the mercy of God that saved us. It's not because of anything we did. We can do nothing but trust and believe. And with that, the grace of God brings salvation and righteousness comes by faith. Right standing with God, the right to stand in God's presence pleasing our lives, pleasing to God because we bleed, because we are born again. Life block lesson number nine, which we went through last week, taught us the Romans road to salvation. Do you remember that? I want to rehearse it to you real quickly so that you can keep this in mind. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, okay? We've all fallen short of, 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 of God's image, Okay? We created Adam and Eve. God created Adam and Eve like him. We have fallen short of that image, okay? All have sinned. Romans 6, 23 says, the wages of sin is death. We deserve death for that sin, for falling short of God's image. But God has a gift. The the, the gift of God, this free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus, through Christ Jesus our Lord. We can come through him and obtain eternal life when we were deserving of death. Romans 10, 13, these three things, 323, 623, 1013, the Romans road to salvation. Romans 10, 13 says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here we find everyone is in sin. We deserve to die, but we can go to heaven with a free gift if we will believe him. And if we will call upon the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. Many times, in order to rightly understand a scripture, in order to rightly understand the truth of one scripture, we must read that scripture in context. That means to view the surrounding scriptures, to make sure that you're actually reading that one accurately in its place so we're not misquoting or we're not partially quoting a truth. This truth, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, sounds too good to be true. And in and of itself, when we read it, it sounds as though that that this is a trigger that we can pull. Call upon the name of the Lord and we are saved. 
to read this truth in context, let's look at, at how this truth is set up in verse 9 and verse 10. Simply, it says this in verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Why? Because verse 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness. You see, there we are again. It's our faith, our belief, our trust in God that puts us in a right standing place with God, gives us the ability to approach God. And as we stand before him, confession is made unto salvation. We access the grace of God, the salvation of God, because with our heart we we believe, and from right standing with God, our confession is made unto salvation. Once again, the scriptures confirm that righteousness comes by faith. Why, you may ask, is it important that I understand righteousness? Because righteousness is the position from which we fight. Righteousness is the position from which we pray. Righteousness is the position from which we interact with a world that's lost and going to hell. Righteousness, our standing with God, creates in us a grace while we can access the grace and the storehouse of God, not only for ourselves but for others. And God does not want us feeling inferior feeling as though we do not have a right to his grace or a right to access him, a right to stand in his presence. God wishes that his children would come before him boldly, that we would enter the throne of grace boldly, that we would stand in his presence as though we have a right to that. Because many times, if the devil cannot in some other way detour you or distract you or derail you, he will just begin to make you feel as though you're unworthy. And those insecurities make you feel unwelcomed in God's presence, especially if you have sinned. Because if you have sinned, the devil will do his best to cause you to separate from God in your own mind whenever God, just like in Adam and Eve's case, calling out to them, wishing they would come to him because he has the remedy. He can help. Glory. We'll get to that in just a moment. But it's important that we stand in a place of righteousness so that we can conduct our spiritual lives and our spiritual affairs from the solid ground of being right with God because of our faith, because in Christ we were made righteous. We did not become righteous because we did good things. We became righteous because he did something. Okay? And we trust in what he did. This brings us to our key scripture for tonight. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, that's the great exchange I spoke of earlier. It occurs when Jesus took our place. It occurred when he took our place and we took his righteousness. We were made the righteousness of God. He was made sin. We were made righteous with God. We were given that robe of righteousness, Isaiah 61.10 says, to cloak us so that we might stand right before God. Romans 5.19 says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Again, we're made righteous. You know, by one man's sin, Adam's sin, many were made sinners. So by Christ and one man's uh, uh, obedience many be made righteous. Let me give you our important points for tonight, okay? Uh, important point number one. It is not the sin we commit which eternally condemns us, but rather it is the sinner we are. It's not the sin you commit that eternally condemns you, but it's the sinner you are. That's why you must be born again. Number two. Righteousness is a state of a person's life when God is pleased with them. Number two, righteousness is the state of a person's life when God is pleased with them. Number three, it is not the right things we do. 
It is the righteousness we are that secures us. It's not the right things we do. It's the righteousness we are that secures us. You might say, does this mean I don't have to do right things? God forbid. There's no reason for you to go there. There's no reason to take this out of context. But let me tell you, you are made right through Christ and not by what you do. You cannot do enough to get right with God. You can only be right through faith. Even if you sin, you can still only trust God and His Word and restore righteousness. Number four, we have been given a garment of salvation and a robe of righteousness by Christ Jesus. You can read that in Isaiah 61 in verse 10. Again, let me reiterate, we are not right because we do right things. We are right because God did something. And we trust God, we are made righteous. You cannot do enough penance to cover your sin. That is not the truth of the Word of God. You cannot work to cover your sin. You are right, not because of the right things you did. You are righteous because of the righteousness He made you when you trusted Him. This brings us to point number five. The temporary stain of sin is cleansed by confession to God alone. Just as Adam and Eve came before God ashamed of their sin and they made confession to Him, we too are admonished to make our confession to Him. That's what 1 John 1, 9 says. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God bless you. Susan, what is your question for today? Um, how does one get saved? How do you know that you're saved? How do you know if you died, you'd go to heaven? I'm going to pray a prayer with you. If you'll sincerely pray this prayer with me, mean it from your heart, you will be saved. And you'll know that if you died, you'd go to heaven. Pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I realize that I have sinned against you, but I am willing to repent. I choose to repent, to turn away from being a sinner. And right this moment, I open the door of my heart and I take you, Lord Jesus, into my heart to be my Lord and my Savior. I give my life to you. Fill me, Lord Jesus, with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for coming into my heart. Thank you for saving me. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, it's very important that you contact us because we have some information to help you get started in your Christian life. I would like to write a letter to you so that you can know how to win your friends and your family to Christ. And then we'll send you other information to help you get started. So here it is. Remember, realize that you've sinned against God, choose to repent, and receive Jesus into your life. Jesus said, him that cometh to me or her that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. So if you come to him, he will not cast you out. You can know him and know that you're saved and know if you died, you'd go to heaven. And then share that with others. It's so important that we be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. So call us or email us. Please let us have contact with you so that we'll be able to help you along the way in your Christian life. Find a good Bible-believing praising, worshiping church, and join that church so you'll have a pastor to help you as you go along in your Christian life. God bless you. I believe that God is going to do great things in your life.